Well, thank you very much, Jesse. Appreciate that. I've always admired uh, uh, good guitar work since back in my Doobie Brothers age, age, teenagers. Who knows about the Doobie Brothers? Good, thank you. I always have to check, especially our young adults. They think I'm probably referring to something else when I say Doobie. <laughs> In, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for everybody who contributed to this day. Uh, we have um, quite a few people that just do things without even being asked to do them, step in and uh, work on things like the sound and the, uh, the stage itself, uh, provide snow cones and other wonderful things for us all throughout the day. And I really appreciate uh, all that effort and I can actually see the Holy Spirit of God kind of coordinating all that for us. It doesn't need to be policed over or even asked, so thank you for uh, all your contributions. In uh, Matthew 3, in verses 13 through 17, you don't need to turn there, I think we understand uh, the story. This is John the Baptist uh, baptizing at the time, and Christ coming before him to be baptized. John was Jesus' cousin. There's some indication uh, when uh, uh, Mary was first uh, impregnated with, the, with Jesus Christ, or the one who would become the Christ, uh, that when she approached her cousin Elizabeth, uh, that in her womb was John the Baptist, and that inside he leapt. She could feel him leaping. There was uh, an indication that there, there was a spiritual recognition there, I guess, of some sort. And uh, it lasted probably throughout their lives, especially if they were cousins related to one another. But when Christ came to him, he said, you know, I'm not worthy to to loosen your sandal strap, how um, you should be baptizing me. And he knew unequivocally at that moment in time that Jesus was indeed the Christ. Uh, he saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus like a dove. Uh, he heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yet nine chapters later, John sent, had to send two of his disciples to Jesus seeking some reassurance he had been kept in prison for a while, was about to be beheaded, and doubt was creeping in. The question he had his disciples ask Jesus was, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? That was Matthew 11 and verse 3. It is human to second-guess ourselves, even something that we know uh, without any, any doubt at all at a moment in time can sometime later uh, give us cause for doubt and to wonder. Even those who have been led through repentance and faith and know they've been through that, to be baptized or immersed in the death and resurrection of Christ and receive God's Holy Spirit can question their conversion. I've seen this too many times. I've talked to many longtime members who go back and wonder and doubt. Sometimes persecution, as John faced, extended trials, the stubbornness of sin, continuing to stumble in some cases. Often, just time itself can all make us doubt. Faith is not without doubt. And I think some people struggle with that because when they feel like they're doubting, then maybe they're not being faithful enough. But doubt's never going to leave us as a human being. Faith is there to shackle doubt and to overrule doubt. Faith is a choice to rule over doubt. Just as courage is a choice to subjugate fear. We're always going to be fearful. Heroes have fear, but in courage to know what they should be doing, they, they make sure that the fear doesn't lead them. Wisdom is a choice uh, to address and overcome foolishness. Humility is a choice to reject pride. Love is a choice to dispel selfishness. These are all character choices. And that character has got to be built. In the meantime, we will have to face all of these things. They're all battles that Christians will often lose in this age. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll recognize that, uh, that we've lost these and maybe continue to lose some. But each one of these battles is part of a spiritual war that we know we will win. I often re refer to George Washington and the Continental Army fighting the British and losing nearly every altercation and battle they went through, but he, and he just kept retreating. That was, his, that was Washington's uh, strategy, keep retreating, stretch out their supply lines, thin them out until finally in Yorktown, 
um, they are able, they won the last battle, which is the one we have to win, is the last battle, and we will. Now, God knew we could lose sight of that victory, so he gave us a guarantee, but sometimes that guarantee is not as obvious as it could be, and this day reminds us of that guarantee. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll just read, read three scriptures up here, uh, up front in this message to see uh, what Paul is pointing to here. 2 Corinthians 1, we'll read verses uh, 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. A guarantee. This gift of God's Holy Spirit that leads us is the guarantee that we will inherit the kingdom, that we'll be born into the kingdom of God as spirit beings, that we will marry Jesus Christ at his return. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. We'll read verses 1 through 8. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He says we have this, this house within us, not built with our hands, not physical in nature. Verse 2, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that the mortality or that mortality may be swallowed up by life, life eternal. Verse 5, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee, a down payment, like, like an earnest that he has given us. So we don't have to doubt Verse 6, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. It is a spiritually given gift, faith. The ability to believe God's word enough to do what he says. That's the faith. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 here. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll read verses 3 through 14. This whole, this whole beginning here in chapter 1 talks about the gifts that God has given us. One of them is specific, and uh, I, I'd like to begin uh, where this ends. Ephesians 1, begin reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved, in the literally the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace of his grace while he made uh, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are in earth, on earth in him in him we also in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who are uh, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The bride of Christ has remained faithful through a very extended betrothal period, longer than anyone else <laughs> ever. Um, but the engagement ring that she wears is God's Holy Spirit of promise. 
And every time she looks at it, she remembers the promise. She remembers what she's here for. She remembers how that betrothal period began and where it will end. It's her guarantee. Like a woman engaged to marry, her engagement ring reminds her that God is with her and in her. It comforts her in her weight. It encourages her in her work to prepare. It is her reassurance of her eternal place at Christ's side in the holy family of God. But it is not always as easy to see as a ring on a finger, and especially in times of doubt, persecution, trial, extended periods of time, struggling in those things, it can be very difficult to see. In John chapter 3, Christ was explaining to Nicodemus how the Holy Spirit works, and he compared it to the wind. You can't actually see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind rustling through the trees, you know, blowing paper or whatever. Uh, though it cannot be seen, the Holy Spirit can be understood uh, and its effect can be seen by what it does, just like the wind, by what it affects. In Acts 2 and verse 2, we've touched on this a few times today already, they heard the sound of the wind. So the apostles were in that room uh, and uh, it filled the house. The sound of the wind from heaven filled that house. They could hear it, but they never saw the wind. Similarly, God's Holy Spirit is seen by its effect in our lives. So where, where do we look when we're looking for evidence of that engagement ring, evidence of God's Spirit within us or leading us? How do we know we are led by God's Holy Spirit? Let's answer that question today. And let it become for all of us as we move forward from this day that look at the engagement ring, God's promise to us, because that's what his Holy Spirit in us and leading us is, his promise. First, first, those who are led by God's Holy Spirit are convicted. They're convicted. Conviction is a, a conscience issue. God's Holy Spirit works with a conscience to begin the conversion process and then continues to work in that consciousness of that individual once the conversion process has begun. There are only two convicting agents mentioned in the scriptures. We've been through this before. God's word and God's spirit. Those are the only two things that can convict a mind, a conscience. And you know how that works. That the conscience is weighing choices and decisions as to what to do, what to believe, which direction to go in, the Holy Spirit is that 300-pound brick that you put on one side of it and the scale goes, boom. <laughs> I know what to do. I know where to go. I don't have any doubts anymore. It's said in his word, his spirit is leading me in that direction. I'm convicted. That's how we all began this process. That's what continues us through it. Christ attributes this level of resolve to the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, back in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Luke described this feeling when the people responded to Peter's sermon. They said, or he described them as being cut to the heart. Cut to the heart. That is a belief that leads one to repentance, to faith, and to immersion or baptism, so that we are all in this thing. No doubts whatsoever. When you're, think of when you were baptized. Nothing stuck out of that water. And as, a, as a, one who has baptized, we know that if, if a toe was hanging out, a finger, anything, we got to do it over. Because symbolically, you got to be all in. You got to be all in. And that's what this convicting uh, effect of the Holy Spirit does for us. Look at John 14. We uh, read the section of scriptures the night of the Passover. But sometimes, again, I think we just we move through these so quickly and we almost rarely come back and review them. From this point, and perspective. Christ mentioned a lot about the Holy Spirit and its effect. Let's look at this here. John 14, we'll read verse 15, verses 15 through 17. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Remember who he's addressing here. And he said, those in the upper room that had just shared that meal with him, Judas had left, but this is the 11 who remained who would become the apostles. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that word there is parakletos, in reference to the Holy Spirit. It's also translated comforter. 
that he may abide with you forever. That is a reference to God and Christ abiding with us forever. The Holy Spirit is their power, the power by which they can do this. You can read this, that it may abide with you forever. Uh, and uh, some would prefer that, just so that they're not giving personage status to the Holy Spirit. Um, it calls it in verse 17, the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows it, or sees it, nor knows it, but you know it, for it dwells with you and will be in you. There, it will be noticeable. It will be something that we can see. We can recognize its effects. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So even after he left, he recognized that in the power of the Holy Spirit, which both he, the Father, and the Son share, they will, he will be with us. We will not be left as orphans. Look at verses 25 and 26 here. The things I have spoken to you uh, while being present with you, uh, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things that I said to you. This is how the conscience works. So you're, you're, you're trying to make a choice to do something. What should I do? And you're, and you're about to make a choice and something in your conscience says, hold on, wait a minute. Let me bring this to your remembrance. Remember what the Word of God said here? Remember this experience you had in times past? Remember how that ended? All this stuff is what the Holy Spirit brings to mind in the conscience that helps us with those choices. And if you're experiencing stuff like that, if you're going through those things, it doesn't have to be on a daily basis, but it could be, then you recognize the Holy Spirit is leading. The question here, the choice of character is, do we follow? Do we follow? And if you're honest with yourself, you're going to recognize the times when you don't do that. And you make the mistake, you learn the lesson the hard way, then you repent, you confess your sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive, as he says in 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9, 10. And at that point, we move forward. We continue to move forward, always forward. Look at chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. Chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send it to you. And when it has come, it will convict the world of sin. Convict. And of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this age is judged. Now, this, this experience that we go through, uh, it looks like, and some people think, that the Holy Spirit and Christ cannot dwell together at the same time. That's a physical human view of this. But that's not what's being discussed here, and we've reviewed this before as well. That if Christ is always there in, in person, we can see him, we can learn from him, we don't have to make choices. We just do whatever he does. Or we can ask him what to do and he tells us. But he had to go so that we had to make choices for ourselves based upon the leadership he gives us in his Holy Spirit. We've got to develop that character. He can't be like that. Uh, he cannot be hovering over us our entire lives and expect us to develop the same character that he and God the Father have. He'll always be with us but in spirit. We'll always have his word, and he'll always be leading us, but we've got to make the choice to follow. It'd be easy if, he's, if we could see him standing right here, wouldn't it? He's here right now, but in spirit. That's much more difficult to see. You, you, you see his presence, his leadership, his guidance in the effect that it has on us, and it begins in the conscience. Look at the... Um, Actually, I want to wait on that one just for a moment. We'll read verses 13 through 16 in a moment. Without the Holy Spirit residing within us or leading us, our dependence on the material and the temporal world would overwhelm our recognition of the spiritual and the eternal. His word would not be, mean as much. We, we are in the process of trying to break away from the influence of the flesh and this physical material world to embrace, embrace a spiritual existence that we will have for eternity. The Holy Spirit leads us in doing that. But it's got, it's, it begins with conviction, and that conviction takes us forward. That's number one. Number two, 
we grow in understanding with the very mind of Christ. We grow in understanding with the very mind of Christ. Look at, uh, stay in chapter 16, we read verses 13 through 15. However, when it, in reference to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, has come, it will guide you into all truth. For it will not speak on its own authority, but whatever it hears, it will speak. And it will tell you things to come. It will glorify me, for it will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that it will take of mine and declare it to you. This, this could be a message all by itself. The spirit of truth leading into all truth. That's the word of God. That's where the Holy Spirit will point us. And anyone led by God's spirit who is teaching that will point to the scriptures. Not to ourselves, not to a body of believers, not to a place to attend, not even of things to do in this age. It will, it will make, let the individual make the choice, but point to the scriptures. And hopefully the Holy Spirit is leading that individual to make those choices. He, it will tell us things to come. One of the most uh, in, influencing effects of the Holy Spirit is knowing what's ahead of us, not necessarily immediately, but by the pages of Scripture, understanding what the end of the end times is going to look like and what should we be attaching to in this age. The remnants of things that are fading away and will be destroyed, melted with fervent heat, as Peter calls it, or are we focusing on the spiritual things? If we see that in us, if we see ourselves making the transition away from this physical world to this, this spiritual world in which God and Christ live, in, in which they are inviting us to be a part of, we need to be part of that now. The Holy Spirit leads us to do that. This is described by Paul in 1 uh, Corinthians 2, how it affects the way we think. Let's go there, 1 Corinthians 2, and we'll read verses 6 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 6, Paul here is discussing how when he spoke, as he taught, what he did in front of the Corinthian uh, converts was not according to the intellectual powers uh, of men, uh, even though he was quite the intellectual, quite accomplished, very intelligent. He didn't rely on that. What did he rely on? Uh, verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature uh, not yet the wisdom of this age, or yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. We just discussed this a few months ago. The hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, leading us into all truth. Others can read the same exact scripture, but not understand what it says. The Holy Spirit imparts that understanding and expects us to act on that understanding. God does. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You've been hearing this all day long in the, in the messages we've been hearing, in the songs that we're singing Every Sabbath, every holiday day we go to digs into the depth of the scriptures. And if you're understanding, the Holy Spirit is enabling you to do that. The Holy Spirit's leading you to understand. That's a, that's a view of that engagement ring. That's a view of God's promise that we should be taking with us every time we light off our knees in the morning. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So if you're learning the things of God, what he's like, how he thinks, what his law is all about, the depths of it, how he lives, that you're learning and understanding those things, it's the Holy Spirit that's imparting that to you. Uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit, which is from God, that we might know things, the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That, that gives us the ability to be peacemakers. When, we, when there is some physical slight thrown at us in this age, 
If we're thinking spiritual, comparing spiritual things to spiritual, not comparing ourselves with other physical human beings, how wealthy they are, how smart they are, and whatever it is they're doing to us or for us, we don't compete with them. We don't have envy of that. And we don't allow those things to hurt us long term or or take our crown from us. Spiritual with spiritual, comparing that in our minds and using that as a basis for our reasoning. It's, it's, It's what keeps us on this path. Many hear the words of God, but do not understand them. Christ said in Matthew 22, verse 14, many called, but few are chosen. The difference between the two is the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It it literally is the mind of Christ. Uh, Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is is rightly judged by no one. In that sense, you're not so much worried about what other human beings think of you. Someone led by God's Spirit is more concerned about what God thinks of us. Verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Could, could, Could there be any more encouraging thought? than to know that we have the mind of Christ, that we can think and reason as Jesus Christ does. Look at Philippians chapter 2 here. Philippians chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 5. I want us to understand that this, this, this knowledge, this understanding that we grow in, in the mind of Christ, is not just knowledge. It's not just something that's academically or intellectually learned. Certainly that has its place. But the Holy Spirit enables that to become written into our hearts so that it becomes part of who we are. It's a character issue. Philippians chapter uh, um, 2, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, we'll talk about that in a moment, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy, by being like-minded, not contentious, and not even afraid to discuss issues, things, opinions, and so on, knowing that we are anchored by the Holy Spirit to his word. And every one of us, led by his Spirit, will defer to the word of God, not to our opinions, our experiences, our education, nothing. should uh, overwhelm our ability to judge and reason from the pages of Scripture. The mind of Christ would do that. Uh, Verse 2, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, humility. Let each esteem others better than himself. Well, I've got to express this opinion because I'm smarter than this person and they need to know what I think. Not not in the mind of Christ. I, I heard someone say once, uh, this was years ago, and I think they were corrected and, and think differently now, but they said, well, well, Jesus Christ and God the Father don't agree on everything. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> That's what it means to have one mind. We have to be willing to talk about these things in 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 uh, gentle, kind, loving ways, tender ways, gentle ways. But we've got to come to some consensus, and it's got to be based on the Word of God. We don't just defer to one another's opinion. We don't defer to our own opinion. We shouldn't care you know, what somebody believes or what they think. What does the Word of God say? Because that's the basis of our unity. Verse 4, "...let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others." Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Again, this is not just about knowledge, but character. As as Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, truth in love. If you look at our history in the past hundred years in the church of God, it's like the first 60 or 70 was all about the truth. Since that time, we have been learning some difficult lessons in how to love, how to live the truth in love. And some have not done well. Others have done very well. That's number two. We grow in understanding with the mind of Christ. Number three, we have hope founded on righteousness, peace, and joy. Hope. 
but not without a foundation, not just some feeling that we have. It's founded on an understanding of where our righteousness comes from. It's imparted by God. We don't earn it. We're not righteous in and of ourselves. God's imparted it. We need to know why. And it's also based on peace and joy that is founded on that righteousness. Look at Romans 15 here. Romans chapter 15. We'll read verses 4 through 13. This follows uh, uh, the, the chapter, Romans 14, on uh, deferring to one another. It's talking where Paul talks about don't condemn one another for eating meat offered to idols or not. Don't look down on one another. Don't be judgmental on, on, other, on, another, on issues that don't really matter. This is, that's not, he's talk, talking about doctrine there. We went through that before. He says this afterwards, and it's all based on hope. Romans 15, again, we'll read verses 4 through 13. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's all based upon our understanding and application of the scriptures and a, a belief of knowing God wants us to be one. Jesus Christ asked him that we would be one and that the Holy Spirit would lead us to be one. Verse 7, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. Uh, sorry. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who, uh, he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Remember Mr. Morker's sermon this morning about how it was prophesied and understood that this would be given to the Gentiles. We were discussing something after his sermon, how how the Israelites here, Abimelech and Naomi and their sons, left their inheritance for Moab. And it was a Moabitess, actually, that have a, had a deeper understanding and belief and trust and commitment of God to give up everything she had and go back to the land that they left, that they forsook. Verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you hope? Is it based on an understanding of where your righteousness comes from? I mean, is it based upon the peace and joy that you have within, no matter what happens in the world around us? That comes from his spirit. Look back at uh, Romans 14 here for a moment. Romans 14, we'll read verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. That was not the subject here. That was the example he was using. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, which then led to the discussion of hope in, in Romans 14 that we just read. We have hope founded on righteousness, peace, and joy. That was number three. Number four, we are family. All of us right here. Everyone led by God's Spirit, before his throne, listening to him teach today on his Feast of Pentecost, we are family. And that goes so much deeper than just being an acquaintance or just being in this similar proximity to one another. Look at Romans 8 here. This is something we have seen violated so much, in our, at least in my past 39 years, maybe yours has been longer, with all the splits and divisions and arguments that we've had in what was supposed to be the body of Christ, but actually it turned out just to be a, a corporate body of men that we falsely put faith into, we should be able to see the spiritually led body of Christ amidst all that without letting the corporate bodies divide like they've done. Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. 
That's where that conviction and understanding in the mind of Christ leads us. Uh, and then founded on that hope, we recognize who we are. It describes it here. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So these effects that we're discussing here today, that we see the Holy Spirit working in our lives, this is how you recognize the body of Christ. And it's not a, a corporate label of men. It has to do with how people are living, what choices that they're making, what character they're growing in. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption or sonship by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are family we are brothers and sisters. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Joint heirs with Christ, children of God. What, what, what are the implications of that? Well, family doesn't forsake one another. We don't walk away when somebody else is hurting. We, we don't ignore when the family assembles together. In Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25, we're told that. Do not ignore, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, especially as the end is coming. Be together, encourage one another, strengthen one another, help one another. Be the family God wants us to be. They also don't walk away. Family doesn't walk away without saying a word. Just walk out the door and never see anyone they would consider their family ever again. 1 John 2 verse 19 tells us this. Those who left us were never of us. If they can do that, they are not being led by the Spirit of God. They don't know they're part of a family. That's very sad. As Christ, when he promised us that he will never leave nor forsake us, Hebrews 13, verse 5, he will never leave nor forsake, they, the family of God, the brothers and sisters, will never, no, never leave nor never forsake one another. That's how the Spirit of God leads. And when we see somebody hurting, we help. When we need, see somebody that needs encouragement, we're there to do just that. Think of your family. Think of your brothers, your sisters, your parents, and how they interact together. I know that's harder, getting harder and harder to see, at least God's designed for it as the end time goes on. Family's under tremendous attack. But just take an understanding of what God designed his family in his word and recognize that. Do we share that kind of bond? I, I, you know what? I've got, a, I've got a strange family, my mother's side. I could say that because all of her brothers and sisters are dead now. <laughs> But we, and they will tell you they're quirky. They will tell you they've got issues, they've got problems. And they argue all the time. But you know what? They love one another. And it's obvious. They have a great passion for life. And sometimes that rubs each, they rub each other the wrong way. But they will, they will not want to be with anyone else on the planet than with themselves. I know this. I, I grew up in it. And I, I think we understand what the word is talking about here. In Mark 14, verse 50, when Jesus was taken, arrested at Gethsemane, every one of his disciples forsook him. But later, after they received the Holy Spirit, all but one would die for him. And even that one, if given the opportunity, would have taken it. Wouldn't the Holy Spirit work similarly in us? toward other members of the body of Christ? If Christ is in us, if we are led by his Holy Spirit, would we do those kinds of things? Look at Philippians chapter 3 here. Philippians chapter 3, we'll read verses 17 through 21. Moses was... Uh, we don't know when he understood that he was actually an Israelite. We, he, it may have been since he... We always understood that, even from the early ages. But 
He chose, we're told in Hebrews, that he chose suffering and persecution with Christ or with his family, the Israelites, rather than all the riches of Egypt. Would we make that choice? If somebody came here today, the police, and rounded us up and marched us off into jail, and they said, oh, well, you don't have to come, you, you can stay, we know you, and you're okay, what would you do? Would you go with your family? Or would you stay behind? You know, maybe that's what the place of safety will be like. Who knows? Philippians 3, verse 17. We'll read through verse 21. Brethren, join in following my example, Paul writes, and note those who so walk, as you have for us a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Children of God are citizens in his kingdom. They honor the king, they honor his dominion, they honor his laws, and they honor his subjects, their fellow family members. Look at 1 John 4 here. 1 John chapter 4, and we will read verses 12 and 13. We've read through the section of scripture many times in discussing what Paul calls the, uh, or I'm sorry, what John calls the spirit of Antichrist those who profess Christ but don't confess him in their words and their actions and the things that they do and the commands that they keep, those who do confess Christ in what they do and how they live and the character attributes that they're developing, they're becoming chips off the old block just like their father. That's how a baby grows in the womb. Those personality traits are transferred from one to the other. And they're learned as a child grows. Verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. This is 1 John 4, verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know. We know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. It's the spirit that leads us to love one another as family and recognizing all the implications of being sons of God, children of God. We have an obligation to one another. We have a desire within us that the, the only place we want to be, the best place, is with our family. And, you know, and, and Uncle Joe's quirks and you know, Aunt Stacia's uh, bad language or Whatever things that, that we bring to the table, we're, gonna, we're figuring out that God's Holy Spirit is going to work out. Right now, we love one another as brothers and sisters. That's number four. We are family. Number five, we continue to depart from sin. Those who are led by the Holy Spirit continue to depart from sin. Never stops. It never ends in the flesh because the flesh is a generator of sin. So we always have to be on guard. We always have to be fighting it. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 here. 2 Timothy 2. And we'll read verses 15 through 21. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. Not, not with a personal perspective on it or, or an opinion or, or one person's odd idea, but rightly dividing it, led by his spirit to do so. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. We, we've got to recognize that to focus on sin, we cannot be distracted by all the other things that are not a violation of God's law. What does God want us to do? What is righteousness like? Do we really have to study 
uh, genealogies and other things that Paul told us not to get involved with because it just, they're just distracting you from the focus of overcoming sin? Verse 17, and their message will spread. I'm sorry, verse 16. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. Remember the reference to the seal of God's spirit earlier? This expands on it. Having, God's, uh, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from injustice. The, depart from uh, unrighteousness of heart. That's where the fight begins. That's where it starts. That's where it has to be had. Uh, verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and stone or clay, for some honor in and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. We have to continue to fight sin. The Holy Spirit is God's seal of authenticity on us. And it is seen in this. Everyone named Christian is departing from iniquity. Everyone who calls himself Christian and is not departing from iniquity, not worried about injustice or that unrighteousness of the heart, is not Christian. Now, we don't have to accuse them of that. We don't have to put them down. Everybody's got things to learn. Everybody's on a, a different level as we're climbing, growing in character toward the kingdom of God. But we should recognize it specifically within ourselves. The Holy Spirit will continue within us to depart from sin. Number six, we bear fruit. The Holy Spirit in us bears fruit. And we know those uh, references to those attributes. Let's go there. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, we'll read verses 22 and 23. Galatians 5, verse 22. These are the things that we should be seeing over a period of time. It's not going to happen the day we're baptized. It's not going to happen a week, a month, a year later. But eventually you should be able to see growth there. And you know what helps? Your family, your family can show you how you've grown. You know, you know, Joe, I remember, I have a bad name. But I don't want to pick out anyone who has that name here. Charlie, any Charlies here? Good. You know, Charlie, if the Bossermans were visiting, I'd have a problem. But, you know, Charlie, I, I remember, remember two, three years ago where you were struggling with this and we talked about it and, you know, we, we, I gave you some, I told you I was doing something similar to that before, and I was able, able to overcome that. And you began studying into that. You ordered booklets and articles, and you started practicing this. We both prayed about it together. Look at you now. I mean, that's in your past. You, you've beaten that. And a right response would be, no, I'm just kind of holding it down <laughs> for now. You know, I'm, 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 I'm subjecting it. If I, but if I give up that fight, that battle, I know it's going to come out again. That's the kind of level of conversation we need to be having, right? Not about politics, not about sports. I'm, I'm not saying you can't talk about the Vikings here. But it shouldn't go on for, you know, half an hour, an hour. Talk about the message. Talk about the things we're learning spiritually. Talk about the growth that you see in others. This is when we come together when we don't forsake the coming up together, this is how we lift up and encourage one another. I see growth in you. I see God in you more and more every day. Every Sabbath we come together. That's probably the most encouraging thing any son of God can hear. And you're not going to hear it anywhere else in this world. You just won't. We bear fruit. Here, the, here it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Are you becoming more loving? And a answer that objectively. This, this examination process started uh, the day we were baptized, but it intensifies in the spring holy days, before the Feast of Unleavened Bread and right through to Pentecost. Where is the evidence of the Holy Spirit within us? Are you more loving, more peaceful? Are you learning how to be a peacemaker? Are you patient, more patient than you were, say, three, four, five years ago? 
uh, that here it's referred to as long suffering. Are you kinder? Are you, are you developing God's goodness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, his self-control? These are all attributes of his spirit. And there are others mentioned other places. James talks about the meekness of godly wisdom, the willingness to yield, all attributes of peacemakers, all attributes of the Godhead, all led into by the Holy Spirit. If you're seeing this, and you're seeing the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit within you or within others. The Holy Spirit develops in us the very nature and character of God. Those with God's Holy Spirit see themselves desiring these attributes. I want to be like this. We may be far from it in our own minds, but desiring is where it comes from first. This is what God's like, and that's what I want to be like. So I'm going to begin practicing those and growing in those attributes. Give it time. It's going to take time. But we should all see that, not just in one another, but especially in ourselves. Lastly, number seven, the Holy Spirit in us enables us to continue the fight. This is a war that we are in. Uh, we live on the very planet of the one who wants to destroy us, greatest, most intelligent deceiver ever. And God placed us here for the specific reason to take him on. I mean, I mean not the toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face, but with God's spirit. This is a spiritual battle. It's not physical. It's not like we're duking it out. But it is a physical fight that we are in. And quite often, if we don't see the power of the Holy Spirit leading us, we'll give up the battle. We'll give up the fight. I've seen it too many times. I think we all have. Look at this, say in Galatians 5, or look at verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit. Some translation says wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Again, if we're honest with ourselves, we should see that, recognize that. Or if we're looking deeply enough, we, won't, we, we can't help but see it. Maybe the issue is we're not looking deeply enough and staying only on the surface. The Holy Spirit can take us there as well into the depths of who we are, what we're becoming. 1 Timothy 6. Let's finish here in 1 Timothy 6 on this point anyway. 1 Timothy 6, read verses 11 through 12. God's spirit, um, his spiritual nature, is grown in battles with the nature of the flesh. It is in that conflict that we see where the line is drawn. As we battle the flesh with the spirit of God, that line is revealed. Okay, I don't cross that. I don't go beyond that. Satan is just trying to give us a little push over that line from righteousness to sin. And it can be a very thin line and very hard to see. But it's taking those things on that helps us understand where those lines are. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. I urge you in the sight of God. Yes. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who witnessed uh, the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until uh, Jesus Christ's appearing. I read beyond where I wanted to. I'm sorry. Verse 11. See, that's why we record these things, so I could just take that last minute right out of there. And to everybody else who hears this, they think I'm a genius. Uh, <laughs> not quite. Uh, uh, first of these six, verses 11 and 12, sorry. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. These are character issues. Not intellectual issues, character issues. The Holy Spirit enables us to take the knowledge that we're learning in the scriptures and turn them into actionable practice so that knowledge becomes written in our hearts. The word of God written in our hearts becomes part of who we are. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. The fight of faith. The conflict that is faith. Understanding the word of God enough to do what he says. In a world where everything is pitted against us, lay hold on it to eternal life. Notice that, lay hold on it. To which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
God imparts eternal life, but his elect to whom he imparts it must seize upon it, lay hold on it, actively, determinedly, assertively, aggressively. Not, not that we earned it ourselves. That's not the point. The point is about a passionate desire to become like God and holding on to that. That's driven by God's Holy Spirit. Paul said it before he was killed in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So will we, brethren. So will we, till the day we die. We've got to see the Holy Spirit working in us. Again, it's not as easy to see as an engagement ring. But if we're looking for its effect, if we know where to look and what to look for, we can see it and be encouraged by it. God's Holy Spirit in us gives us conviction and understanding. The very reasoning ability of the mind of Christ. It infuses us with hope. It makes us family. It enables us to overcome sin. It produces God's very nature within and it keeps us contending in this good and honorable war of faith, regardless of the battles we might lose along the way. Bride of Christ, look often at your engagement ring and rest assured of your eternal place at Christ's side in the holy family of God.